Hello, uh, my name is Jehan Marku, and today I'm going to be sharing my presentation entitled Debunking Myths and Misconceptions of the Psychedelic Industry. Um, the most important thing you may learn today is on this slide, and that is my email address. Uh, so feel free to write me jehan at marku-aurora.com if you'd like any of the references or further information. Mm -hmm. So who am I and what am I doing here? Two very important questions to always ask before beginning anything involving psychedelics. So uh, I received my PhD for studying molecular pharmacology and cell biology of drugs and their interactions at receptors, largely focused on cannabinoids, things like THC and other drugs of abuse. I am also a published basic and clinical researcher. I have received um, training in psilocybin-assisted therapy, and I'm also the editor-in-chief of a research journal. And I'm going to be sharing with you today an article that I published in Rolling Stone about psychedelics. Um, I'm going to start off with some information that's not in that article about the pharmacological history. So we'll discuss a little bit about the early discoveries, um, where we are now with research centers and research. And then I'm gonna go on to a little bit of clarifications or myth busting. Um, we'll talk about how psychedelics are much more than LSD or, or mushrooms. And I really want your imagination to percolate on this. Are there other psychedelic or hallucinogenic products outside of fungi and um, synthesized lab derivatives? Um, I'm also going to talk about publicly traded companies. And I think there is some confusion here about what exactly these companies do, and I hope to clarify that. I'm also going to speak to gimmick ventures and the havoc they're wreck, you know, wrecking on environments and people's health, um, and, and then clearly distinguishing um, some of these so-called health retreats from true clinical and therapy practices. And I'm also going to discuss... Um, the last point is on about taking psychedelics doesn't innately make you better at something. It doesn't make you a better person, doesn't make you a more peaceful person. Practice is the path to mastery. So if taking psychedelics will probably just make you better at taking psychedelics. So, so we'll discuss that. But the main takeaways, uh, the little neatly uh, packaged products I hope you take away from this are one mainly uh, that you now know what the 5-HT2A receptor is or does or what it's involved with or something that it's related to psychedelics in some way. That would be a great takeaway. So this is the main target for the effects of things like psilocybin and LSD. And if you don't know what those are, we'll discuss them in detail shortly. Psilocybin is perhaps, I consider, many experts consider to be the most well-studied psychedelic product in this area. We know a lot more about it. You can, in the United States, you can um, go into a therapy session for psychedelics and it will most likely be a psilocybin purified product. Um, the Sonoran Desert Toad, uh, you may have heard of toad liquors in a crude way. What's interesting about this, and we'll discuss this when we get to gimmick ventures, is there's actually no documented historical use. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Dr. Marku, people have worshipped toads for centuries, not DMT toads. And so this is actually a gimmick that has been conjured up over the last few decades as an excuse to sell, you know, extracted DMT toads to people and to decimate wildlife populations. Um, again, we'll discuss this aspect and I'll share some examples, uh, historical and modern examples of how psychedelics uh, can affect people. We'll also discuss abuse and risks associated with them. And I think one of the main things I'd like people to, to remember is that experiences on psychedelics, especially ego death or revisiting trauma, are not necessarily tranquil or peaceful. And I think we have to think, keep that in mind. While psychedelics do have a great promise in therapy and they have a low abuse potential um, they are not necessarily peaceful experiences for people who are not accustomed to them. However, one interesting thing, despite all that we'll talk about today, one of the take-home points 
early on is that zero, that is zero NIH grants have funded psychedelic assisted therapy clinical trials to the date of the recording of this webinar. So let's move through some of the history of pharmacology. So in the late 1930s, Albert Hoffman was synthesizing a bunch of compounds. He's actually looking at a drug for women's health related to blood pressure and things like that. And when they sent LSD-25 or simply LSD uh, through animal studies and screening, it was apparently useless. It was of not of interest. But for some reason, he was obsessed with it and then accidentally exposed himself to it and went on a famous bicycle ride. Um, since then, by the 1960s, for example, during the first sort of renaissance of psychedelics, uh, there were over 40,000 individuals that took part in research studies. Not researchers, participants in clinical studies. So then um, the chapter closed on that. There were a couple of outwardly facing media people who gave psychedelics a bad name. There was a backlash, prohibition of research. Um, and I don't really like to give those people or those things too much credibility because of all the hard work and just meticulous nature of the research space from the 1940s to the 1960s and helping us understand more about human consciousness and the potential of therapy. And there are even books published in the 1960s about using psychedelics like LSD for the treatment of alcoholism. Fast forward to more recent times, 2004, the University of California, UCLA, uh, specifically researchers began clinical trials on psilocybin for treatment uh, related to things like pain, anxiety, and depression in patients with advanced stage cancer. Um, this is probably considered by some to be just another uh, renaissance. We are considered to be still in that same psychedelics renaissance, and as that potential rises, a lot of myth and misconceptions have, have rise to, to meet it, and we'll get to that in a second. So much like UCLA, it's good enough for California, it's good enough for the West Coast, it's good enough for the East Coast. John Hopkins also started a Center for Psychedelic and Conscious Research in 2006, which has published over 80 articles on psychedelic research. Um, today, uh, we're probably looking at um, about 27,000 research articles published on psychedelic drugs, with over 1,000 specifically on psilocybin, which comes from mushrooms. And again, psilocybin is the most well-studied psychedelic product. So pharmaceutical interest has also increased into, it's not just academic centers, you know, it's not just quiet nerds doing harmless research that no one cares about. Um, Compass Pathways, for example, has um, received uh, FDA status, approval status for a breakthrough therapy for psilocybin treatment that they developed for treatment resistant depression. USA also approved a ketamine analog, and I don't want a bunch of angry emails about how ketamine is not really a psychedelic, but I think it's important uh, for the story here. Again, this is by Johnson & Johnson for use in patients suffering from treatment-resisted depression. Um, 2019, USONA Institute also received US FDA breakthrough therapy status for a psilocybin treatment for major depressive disorder. Um, you know, so I think I'd like to just take a moment to thank the FDA for their working with psychedelic companies, private companies looking to push this further. If we look at the way cannabis has rolled out in the United States, we have to wonder, I wonder what the cannabis space would look like if companies were allowed to do research first or engaged in research first before rolling out products. Um, but again, between 2015 and 2020, there actually have been nearly 550 grants awarded to researchers engaged, engaged in psychedelic research. That's animal research, receptor research, observational research, but again, zero, zero grants for psychedelic-assisted therapy clinical trials. That is, someone's taking a psychedelic, they're sitting in a room with a clinician, 
and they're measuring outcomes. Um, and again, you can read about that in a recent publication from 2022 referenced in the bottom of the slide. So psilocybin, much like other drugs, when you consume it, it is, synthesis, it is metabolized by the body. It is metabolized into psilocybin and it acts upon a variety of targets, but most importantly, 5-HT2A receptors, because the, the majority of the effects of psilocybin are, are, and, and, and LSD for that matter, are prevented if you block the 5-HT2A receptor. Um, you know, if you have a moment, write 5-HT2A on your forehead, so when you look in the mirror, you can remember this important receptor. Uh, a cannabis compound, cannabidiol, very popular these days, CBD, interacts with 5-HT1A receptors. And, and I want to stress 5-HT2A because what a difference a subclass of receptors can make from you know, your experience with that substance. But despite the effects of psilocybin and, and, and popular culture, it is reported to have the most favorable safety profile of all psychedelic drugs. Um, the Registry of Toxic Effects of Chemical Substances has assigned psilocybin with a therapeutic index of 641. Now, this is associated with a better safety profile. Um, again, nicotine has 21, not a great therapeutic uh, index. Uh, aspirin, 199 not a great therapeutic and, uh, index. So objectively, toxicologically, psilocybin has a great therapeutic uh, index, a great window of which to, um, to, to use it for treatment. It's probably why we see treatment centers already operating in the United States. And these are legitimate treatment centers where people get a purified standardized product. Uh, this is not, you know, you're not going to a back alley or the back room at a discotheque to like get some psychedelic treatment or to someone's living room. These are in clinical centers. So no discussion of psychedelics would uh, be complete without discussing the poster problem child of psychedelics, uh, LSD. Um, and, and things have come a long way in the way we do research on psychedelics. Uh, one of my colleagues, you know, use this virtual reality to see how these drugs fit in receptors. And so what you're seeing in the background here is actually um, in purple LSD. Um, and then those beautiful red ribbons are actually the protein structure of the 5-HT2A receptor. So LSD or lysergic acid diethylamide um, or LSD25, um, you may have heard, uh, I, I found this out recently, you know, when people talk about, oh, brown acid or weird acid, it's usually because it's the mixture of other forms of it. LSD-25 is, is the product we are, for the purposes of our conversation today that we're talking about. But if you go out into the illicit market, um, you know, uh, backyard chemists are probably not creating a stable purified form of this target compound. It's probably present, but it's probably present with a lot of other forms of LSD. So this is, again, similar to psilocybin, a 5-HT2A agonist, a drug that targets the 5-HT2A receptor. And of course, these drugs are promiscuous. They, they bind to other receptor subclasses except for the 5-HT3 and the 5-HT4 receptor. Um, where are these receptors? Good question. They, they're throughout the central nervous system. So your brain, your spine, widely expressed in the cortex. Uh, you rub the side of your head, you can, you can just stick your fingers in through your skull a little bit, you'd be massaging your cortex, which is sort of um, a very evolutionary advanced part of the brain, sort of the last brain update that, that we have received as living organisms. And it's difficult to study psychedelics in other organisms because they don't, they barely have a cortex. Mice, rats, they, they barely have a cortex and researchers measure hallucination or psychedelic experiences by looking at how many times their head twitches. Um, so again, in a lot of areas of the brain involving processing of information, we find these 5-HT2A receptors. So there's been a huge tra trajectory over decades looking at various psychedelics, um, their impact on humans, their impact on cells, their impact on animals, and end the last decade 
or so, there's been a huge increase. Uh, psychedelic, psychedelics take flight, as it has been pointed out by Nature magazine. And here we see in gray, psilocybin, in the orangish reddish color MDMA, and in blue, LSD. And we can start to see that, wow, there have been a lot of clinical studies, 17 alone in 2020, um, slightly less in 2021. The stats aren't out for 2022 yet because we're still living it. Um, but I think it was really interesting to see that um, there's been a huge increase in the publication of clinical studies, particularly on psilocybin, as well as MDMA and, and a little bit of LSD. Now, psychedelics um, can be a very intense uh, experience for some people. There are bad experiences. And, and sometimes these bad trips, as they're called, it is actually currently being discussed. There are, there are a large body of researchers who think that bad trips actually have a huge therapeutic relevancy. And it's all about how you integrate these, these experiences. And I love this meme on the left because it, it constantly reminds me that, again, psychedelics experiences aren't necessarily tranquil, tranquil or peaceful, especially for people working through trauma or other issues. But they do have um, a role potentially in improving people's lives. So, so what are some of the abuse, liability, or risks of, of psychedelics? Well, one, there seems to be uh, some harm that can be caused in people with psychedelics or a predisposition to psychosis. Um, again, don't take my work for it. Matthew Johnson, uh, William Richards, who trained me on, on psilocybin-assisted therapy, as well as Roland Griffith, have published studies looking at um, guidelines for safety and the abuse potential of these products. You know, fear, panic, confusion, and, and potentially dangerous behavior are other issues. I've talked to clinicians who have administered this therapy, and you know, now they, <laughs> now they, have, you know, some facilities have changed their protocols because if they, you leave doors unlocked and someone gets a confused or panic episode, even if it's just last two or three minutes, they might get up and run out the door. And so uh, definitely that has happened in clinical settings. Um, there can be moderate elevations in pulse and blood pressure. There can be headaches in the following days. Um, there can also be uh, what's called uh, persisting perceptual changes or persisting perception disorder, PPD, which is the fancy term for flashbacks. Um, where people are experiencing changes um, and um, maybe unwanted experiences after being exposed to the substance. However, the good news is, is data and you know real-world evidence suggests you know no no addiction potential really for these substances. That is, no one's jonesing for LSD or psilocybin the way. Um, that maybe you might observe it for opioids or caffeine or other substances. And again, uh, if you're interested in this area, I, I would highly recommend starting with the 2008 publication, Human Hallucinogen Research Guidelines for Safety. It's absolutely fascinating. So if you were to just base everything you know about psychedelics on the media, you would think that LSD perhaps is the most widely studied, well-known thing, and the thing that everyone's using, the thing we only know about, just like this cover of Time Life, or, or sorry, cover of Life magazine from, uh, I think, 1966, the exploding threat of the mind drug that got out of control. Um, and, um, and so, you know, LSD tends to get a lot of notoriety. But... For our first myth we're going to bust today, psychedelics are more than LSD and mushrooms. What do I mean by that? Well, there is a uh, fish out here that people can consume out in the ocean. Um, this can cause something called, uh, I think it's called shark sickness. Um, and, and again, people have used this for a long time for different ailments. There's also a variety uh, like, like arthritis and pain and things like that. Uh, but it can also, you know, with overindulgence can lead to people being kind of comatose for a couple days or, or um, you know, it, it's a very fascinating thing. Um, there's also corals and other sea life that produce uh, tryptamines and other things that, that are of interest. Um, there are also amphibians, um, uh, certain types of octopi, uh, even horseshoe crabs 
all produce um, some compounds, notably is the tetrodotoxin, which again, is on one hand is it turns can turn people into zombies is, is associated with that um, effect that some of you may be familiar with watching this, but it's also been used a long time to treat things like arthritis and pain and, and other conditions. So invertebrates, vertebrates, ants, fish, and amphibians, you can find marine tryptamines, hallucinogenic fish, psychedelic amphibians. I don't mean I didn't mention insects today. Um, just because I didn't have room on the slide, but these all have potential for human consumption and or abuse. Uh, I'm not, I hesitated to share this information with folks. So I don't want you all running out to just start eating things out of the ocean in hope of having a good time. I would really strongly, strongly suggest you look up this Orsolini article from 2018 about psychedelic fauna to really get a sense of the risks associated with some of these products. But again, the wide, wide breadth of living psychedelic organisms that swim in our oceans and hop along in our fields. So what about these companies we're all hearing about? You can go on a, any you know, tracker for stocks. Psilocybin Alpha is a great resource. This is where this image was pulled. There are a lot of publicly traded companies that don't sell psychedelics. Most of them don't. I think all of them do not sell psychedelics. So what are they doing exactly? They're doing research. This is not a gimmick. This is not a ploy. Uh, this is just a real thing. And anyone can join in the fun. You know, you can, you can uh, start a company, apply for research permissions if needed. Maybe you're just doing a survey. May not need permission from the FDA to just survey people about their perceptions. You could do a literature review. You could engage in some way. Remember, John Hopkins, uh, Center for Psychedelic Studies has published like 80 reviews of the literature on the subject. Raising funds is great because you can pay for more advanced research, animal research, cell research, receptor research, human research, and you can conduct it. For example, MAPS with their PTSD study with MDMA is in phase three currently. Very exciting. That is the technical term for that. That is very exciting. The Soda Institute for Major Depressive Disorders are looking at psilocybin in a phase two study. Also exciting. Um, so again, when we think about these companies, they're not selling mushrooms, they're not selling tabs of acid. Um, they are engaged in research in a very high level with federal permission. So the next subject I wanna talk about is psychedelic gimmick ventures. And I think, um, you know, if you wanna, this has been a, this is an art that as old as humanity itself, you can picture a guy in a top hat at the back of a caboose, like saying, oh, I've got the cure-all for everything. Um, but I, there's this quote by Alan Watts that I, I like to go to when I'm trying to think about the sort of the principle of this, this misconception or this myth. And it's, the quote is, anybody who tells you that he has some way of leading you to spiritual enlightenment is like somebody who picks your pocket and sells you your own watch. And I always like that quote and coming back to it when I'm examining and looking at new offerings in this space. So a couple questions to ask yourself. When you're looking at some of these wellness retreats, who is overseeing it? Are they qualified in any way other than just being really good at taking psychedelics? Um, there's um, a lot of issues around abuse, uh, of all types around people who go to unlicensed um, backyard shamans uh, for a psychedelic wellness therapy. There, there are people who are in the business of conjuring up historical narratives about these products. Um, now, while it's true that many, many indigenous populations may have um, cultivated or created an environment where these things could thrive, not all of them uh, use it. And I think the Sonoran Desert Toad, the DMT frog, as some people call it, but it's actually a toad. Um, there's no historical indigenous use there. We're, we're, we're literally living in a time where we're discovering new creatures that have this ability, this potential that have evolved. Um, and what's happening, unfortunately, in this day and age is that um, these, 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 Toads are being brutally harvested. People say they milk them. 
people say, you know, to discuss, it, they're actually skinned alive. Um, and the, 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 their, their medicine, their extract, their milk is brutally extracted. And their environment has been decimated by illicit market influences. So um, it's great that you all want to pursue enlightenment, but it's, it, you have to make sure it's not at the cost of decimating the wildlife populations. And it would be really amazing if these toads and other amphibians and fish and corals and mushrooms could continue to evolve, continue on their trajectory um, and not be licked out of existence. Um, the, the populations of Sonora and Dares the Toad are considered threatened or endangered. So the psychedelic toad could end with our generation. So one of the myths I hear about all the time is about how psychedelics makes you a better or more peaceful person. But again, it's, you know, practice is the past, the path to mastery. If you take psychedelics, you'll probably just get really good at, at taking psychedelics unless you're already good at something. And so um, I want to illustrate this point. So Vikings were known for taking henbane and Amanita muscaria to give them unearthly powers. And here's a quote. I feel unstoppable now. The gods of war have reawakened me. They've ignited my ego and want me to go to war again. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's, a Viking didn't say that hundreds of years ago. Uh, that was actually Mike Tyson just a little while ago um, after consuming DMT, um, possibly along with cannabis, and returning to fighting at the age of 54. I don't know if it really brought him peace when he's talking about becoming a god of war and one become the oldest uh, heavyweight champion in history. Um, so taking psychedelics doesn't make you a better or, or more peaceful person just from taking them. Um, you know, we can think of the Viking berserkers before they'd go off and raid a village and do ungodly things with godly powers from psychedelics. Um, you know, they, they would consume these things. Uh, Mike Tyson, think about him. He's 54, 55, 56 now going back into boxing after consuming psychedelics. Trauma, ego death, uh, often associated, revisiting trauma and ego often associated with psychedelics, isn't always a tranquil experience for the participant. And the scientific literature is filled with examples of hallucinogenic experience that are not innately peaceful. Um, I'd also like to point out that oppressive and racist groups are associated with perpetually overindulging in psychedelics. I'll give you an example, some of the people involved in the January 6th riots where they went in to go kill elected officials and, and do the whole overthrow of the country, um, some of them purported to be on psychedelics, including the guy wearing horns. Um, and there were even people with exposed tattoos for dark websites where people purchase and consume psychedelics. Um, you can read more about this uh, in Vice magazine. So uh, in summary, I just want to give you a few gems to help you navigate um, this really interesting and fascinating space. Um, first of all, not much of this is new. There's a rich history of scientific discovery going back about 100 years. Um, largely, the reason we can experience these effects are because of serotonergic receptors or the 5-HT2A receptor. Psychedelics are much more than LSD and mushroom. There is a whole ocean of psychedelics out there in the form of marine life to be explored and harnessed for the benefit um, of, of humans. Um, public companies don't sell psychedelics. They are in the business of research and developing approved products in clinical use. Um, if you're going to go to a psychedelic wellness retreat or something like that, trust only train professionals with your health and be environmentally conscious. Uh, don't achieve enlightenment at the expense of destroying the environment or driving Sonoran desert toads or ayahuasca vines to the point of extinction. Um, again, psychedelics, and even according to clinical studies, will not turn you into a peacenik or change your religion. So if you've enjoyed some of the artwork and stuff, uh, most of it is mine, the nature picks, but some of this other stuff is from my podcast, How to Launch an Industry, where me and my colleagues get together to discuss uh, 
clinical studies and other research. Um, here we have Dr. Nigma Marora, Dr. Deb Kimlis, Dr. Ethan Russo, Dr. Sarah Jane Warren, myself, Dr. Marku, and uh, who we call GMP Dave, Dave and Valencourt, who runs the GMP Collective and inspects facilities for compliance to different standards. So if you've liked any of this, I encourage you to shoot me an email or check out um, our podcast wherever um, you download those sorts of things. Thank you so much.